Welcome to everyone online. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Planning for the Future of K-12 Libraries, Multifunctional Learning Commons. I'm Angie Shanick, Manager of New Business Development for DEMCO, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we start our program, there are a few housekeeping details to cover, and then I'll introduce our speaker, and we will start today's presentation. On your screens, you should see a chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or are having any type of technical issue, please type something there and we will address it as quickly as possible. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. If something comes up that you would like clarification on or want to respond to, please type it into that chat box. We will be monitoring this and compiling questions and comments to address at the end. Should we run short on time to address all of your questions, we do write up answers to everything and post them along with the recorded webcast after the event on ideas.demco.com. Contact information for Janet and myself should be on your screen, and we invite you to email us directly with specific questions we may be able to help you with. For all Twitter fans, today's hashtag is hashtag Demco Ideas. The feed is visible on the side of your screen in the chat box. We are monitoring that as well for questions and comments. Now, just for fun, while I'm doing introductions, we are going to pop a poll question onto your screen to help us better understand today's audience. The question is, what is the current status of your school library? Please take a minute to answer, and I will share the results before we start our program. Now, on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Angie Shanick, and I will moderate today's session. At DEMCO, we're always interested in ways to better serve the needs of our customers. Webinars have been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information on important topics for evolving libraries. We are all aware that libraries play a very important role in student learning outcomes. As learning trends change, the library must evolve to support students and staff and continue to engage students. Today's presentation is going to provide fresh insights into how to think about transforming a traditional library space into a flexible learning commons that will maintain its relevance and be a space where students can work effectively. I am pleased to introduce you to Janet Nelson, DEMCO's Director of Library Engagement and Solutions. Janet's presentation will draw upon her 15 years of observation and experience in the library environment. Janet has been working with DEMCO's library customers to help them find solutions to challenges that they face in their libraries. She has significant experience managing and developing relationships with key industry contacts to understand changing library trends and interpret that direction into appropriate products and services. She has an extensive background in product management and development, as well as experience working with library clients on interior projects. Janet has been a panelist on webinar and conference presentations and routinely moderates DEMCO's webinar program. Now, before I turn the reins over to Janet, I'll share the poll results. And it looks like, overwhelmingly, that the majority are planning to make some small changes in their library space. And lots of you are planning for a new updated space in the next 6 to 12 months, and many are hoping for a new space in the next 2 to 5 years. So our hope for today is that by the end of the session, you will have a new understanding of what you can do to create an engaging learning environment for your students. Now, Janet, if you're ready, we're going to put the controls in your capable hands and you can start. Thank you. Thank you, Angie, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Uh, this is a very exciting time for me to be able to share some of this information with you. Um, I'd like to be able to share what I've learned um, about this topic and around how to um, engage libraries. Um, Adam, as we're, as we're going through this, um, my screen is not advancing at this time, so I don't know if there's anything that you can do to be sure that I can advance the screen. So I'll just, I'll just wait a second for that. But, um, okay, Janet, we will yeah. advance the slides for you. Okay. Oh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. Pardon me. Try clicking on the screen. 
and then try to advance. Okay, there we go. We're good. We're good. So um, sorry about that little disruption there. But um, judging from the number of you that are on the call too today, um, and those of you registered for the for the event, um, K through 12 libraries are something that a lot of you are thinking about right now. Um, something that you're you're trying to come up with some new plans for. At the it looks like through the the poll question that. A lot of you, whether it's a big or a small type of change, um, you're just looking for some, some different ways to think about your library. So for those of us who've been around libraries for a while, we're, we're really very aware that the impact of the school library on the student achievement is something that's been studied, um, it's been demonstrated, it's been conducted across the country and over many years, um, that this is really something that, that, that is a real thing in, in a child's learning experience. Um, and more recently, there's been a lot more focus around the space itself and the activities that are offered within that space. So playing a key role in attracting the students um, and getting them more effectively to use their libraries is something that a lot of people are really starting to think about. And there's more non-traditional types of activities that are occurring in the libraries. In addition, this is really a very important time for school libraries. Um, changing education models have really created new opportunities to help libraries retain their relevance in the education ecosystem. The school librarian and the library are resources that, that really have an impact across the entire student body and really beyond because they're very important to the staff, to the families of the students, and in a lot of cases to the community as a whole. So there's a great amazing value that's really offered through these spaces and these services and the people that are involved with these. So um, the image in the background on this slide is of Hadley Junior High School in Glen Ellen, Illinois. And last fall I had an opportunity to hear from the architects, um, FGM architects, and admin an administrator from their school. And they really discussed how they went through a radical transformation process in this particular library. And it made this space into really the center of the library and the center of the community um, in how it, how it became a part of that school and how important it was. And it was really encouraging to hear that story um, because it reinforced a lot of the things that you're going to hear about today. And finally, um, as we're kind of reviewing some of the things that I was reviewing some of the things that you wanted to learn. And one comment that really stood out um, was someone noted that they wanted to learn to be open-minded. And I really loved that comment because it was a great reminder on how it's easy for us to get kind of stuck in what we're doing and see things um, you know, as they've always done. Sometimes it's difficult to really open up our minds and think about how things can be different, maybe view things through a different lens, um, think about how your students are looking at the space and really create the best space for your students and your staff. So let's take a look at what some of these changes mean as we move forward. I know that not all of you who are joining us today are from school libraries, and I know that some of you are hoping that we'll cover some ground that will be relevant to you as well. And I can tell you that from my, my recent experience um, over the past five years, that I've really seen school, public, and academic libraries beginning to blend in how their spaces come together. Um, lots of times I can look at an image and it's, it's becoming more and more difficult to, to know without being informed ahead of time if it's a new space um, of what exactly that space is, whether it's a school or a public or an academic space. So a lot more things are blending together. A lot more services are becoming common across those spaces. Um, I also know that some of you are working with very small spaces, and uh, while you may not be able to use every idea that we present as it's shown, I think you'll find that you can be very resourceful in what you do, and you can adapt some of these ideas so that they will work within your space or your budget, whatever that may be. Um, it's important to kind of think about things and experiment and try different ways to, to use your library. If you can really keep that open mind, you'll find that the principles discussed today will really work across the different types and sizes of the library. In today's presentation, we're really going to start with exploring the trends of education and how those are forcing the library to change. So school libraries are really evolving from a book warehouse to this multifunctional learning resource center that supports these new learning trends. I'm also going to talk about ways to incorporate a variety of zones to support different learning styles. 
And I'll address some of the nuances that are out there between flexibility, adaptability, and variety, as well as utilizing these concepts um, to allow the spaces to sustain functional change over time. So um, we know that, that things are changing very rapidly, and we want to make sure that things can work for the future um, as well as today. The specific learning um, objectives that, that kind of pull things together and we want you to be comfortable with by the end of the session are um, really talking about how these shifts in teaching strategies and learning styles impact educational environments. So um, we know that these things are changing, not just the library, but the entire school. Our focus today will really be around the school library and media center. Understanding the current functions of the 21st century library is important as well, or now we're we'll starting to talk about it as a learning commons as well, and what the space requirements are to support those functions. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how this flexibility, adaptability, and variety can be incorporated into these environments, and we're going to identify ways to incorporate different zones within an environment. And we're going to do those through um, Thornburg primordial learning metaphors, which you'll see really create a nice framework in how to think about this. So as the emphasis on these 21st century skills um, grows, particularly in primary and secondary education, the idea of a learning or information commons is becoming a more and more necessary space within the K-12 environment. Um, the term 21st century skills generally refers to certain core competencies such as collaboration, digital literacy, critical thinking, and problem solving. Um, and advocates really believe that schools need to be teaching um, these types of principles to help students be very successful in, in today's world. You'll also find that the American Association of School Libraries has put out standards for the 21st century learner. And as things like the Common Core Standards have come online, they've created new ways, too, to, to interact and to help students connect with information and literature. So really, the purpose of this learning commons is not really all that different from the original purpose of the traditional library. Um, it's really still this shared learning space. Um, the traditional, the traditional library was really focused around guaranteeing access to knowledge for all. And even though we're using different types of resources to, to access that knowledge today, really we're, we're still doing the same type of thing. We need to teach these different things and provide opportunities for learning, supporting literacy and education, and really helping to shape those new ideas and perspectives um, that are central um, to this creative and innovative society. So lots of times now we're seeing these electronic resources come online. So there's hardware and software and online publications and databases that are all part of that. Um, the print resources, of course, are still there and are very important with the books and the magazines and the newspapers. Um, but now we're also seeing some manipulative resources come into play. So games and tools for imaginative play. Um, Human resources are, are coming into play in a different way than they have in the past. So there's a lot more about sharing and connecting with others. Um, recommendations for a book from a peer um, is sometimes something that really helps um, students feel like they're engaged in the library. Um, librarians having an idea of the scope of resources that are available, um, knowing their clientele, and helping them navigate through this whole new variety of resources is another thing that, that is important in this particular space. Um, overall, having a physical space where people can interact is much better than the internet at connecting these learners with each other. So, you know, as, as more things are available online, it doesn't mean that we don't still need these places to come together um, and learn and work together. Um, lots of times I've heard it said that today's generation is high tech, but they're also high touch. So they still want to be together to learn and to grow. So in this new environment, um, really one size does not fit all. So that's part of what we need to think about. Um, 
it's really important now that we're analyzing more than just the typical square footage and collection sizes and technology needs like we've done in the past. Um, there's more important things that we need to take a look at in addition to those things. So there's really a greater emphasis on making all the pieces in the learning environment work better together. So being a key partner in implementing things such as the Common Core or whatever standards your school is using at this point um, is, is part of ensuring that student success. Um, what resources are available is another thing that needs to be really kind of evaluated. Um, how is the Library Learning Commons staffed? Um, that will have an impact on how that space should be designed. Is there a full-time librarian or a part-time librarian or volunteer staff, or is it a teacher that's in there staffing it part of the time? Um, what activities are expected in the library? There's a lot of new things that, that people are wanting, wanting to do with that particular space. Um, and finally, the philosophy, um, the role that the library plays within the school. Is it really a central part of the school and the curriculum, or is there some other role or purpose that it's serving? More often, we're seeing schools that view their librarian as their tech leader, um, and they're really being invited into discussions around how technology is implemented in their school and in the district. So this all leads to a new set of questions that, that kind of surround the library. Um, so when it comes to space, um, what are the most important functions that are being supported inside that space? Um, how will that space support external functions? So are there groups that are coming in and using that space after school or in the evening hours? And does that space allow for that? Um, the collection itself, are changes in the curriculum impacting that collection? Uh, things like Common Core are making the nonfiction collection take on a little bit different role than it has in the past. Um, how that collection is organized is another thing to think about. So uh, historically, collections have been organized, particularly nonfiction collections, have been organized by the Dewey Decimal System. Um, now there's a lot more cases where information neighborhoods are being used or fiction and nonfiction are being housed together. Um, really things are being housed more in the, the terms of the way you would see in a bookstore or something um, where it's a little bit easier to navigate and it's done more on a subject basis. Does the collection include both physical and digital resources and how are those things being handled? Um, audiobooks and ebooks and things like that, um, you know, they, those types of things have different requirements and different needs. And finally, um, technology. Um, obviously technology is going to continue to evolve um, and how are you addressing those needs? Um, as more and more bring your own device types of things are occurring or schools are getting um, other types of um, devices to support within their space, things like Wi-Fi and power need to be more of a consideration. Um, and finally, what flexibility is that being built in so that these things can be accommodated in the future? So traditionally, the Learning Commons was really thought of as kind of a combination library and computer lab in a lot of cases. Traditionally, we were equipped with, say, rows of shelves to house the book collection, a classroom set up for 24 to 30 students to receive instruction from either the media specialist or their teacher, a large circulation desk for checking out books and allowing space for staff functions, and either, either a bank of computers or and or a computer lab. Um, these spaces were really needed to support the traditional functions of the library for use only during scheduled classroom visits during a school day. So that was really more of a just-in-case model. So as things have evolved, the Learning Commons has really become much more about being this full-service learning, research, and product project space. Um, it's much more multifunctional in nature. The future library space, or for some of you, some of you have evolved to this at this point, um, you're seeing less rolls of shelving. Um, and more digital materials are becoming readily available, so there's less need for a very large book collection. Um, lots of times the shelving is lower in height. Um, the collection is more a merchandise collection as opposed to something that's being warehoused. And lots of times that also helps to increase the circulation rates um, in, these, in these environments. As a result, um, 
part of what needs to be thought about is instead of planning for shelving for growth going into spaces, we think more about how we're going to lead the collection and create spaces for uh, additional functions. So students are encouraged to use the space beyond the normal school day, um, so not just when they have scheduled class times in there, but maybe at their lunch hour or before or after school. And this kind of creates this more just-in-time exploration of learning activities. The learning commons is also a flexible environment, so it can accommodate multiple learning activities and can change over time. So allowing the spaces to be reconfigured for different learning activities um, is, is an important thing. But flexibility is really more than just adding casters to the furniture or putting in a movable wall. So in the example you see here, this is a case where, where it's being able to put casters on products and to collapse them and move them around the space. Um, but you can also see that there's a variety within the space that allows for a number of different activities. So that kind of brings us to these distinctions between adaptability, flexibility, and variety. So these things occur in terms of space, structure, and change. So this is really adapted from the book, um, The Language of School Design by Prakash Nair. And if you haven't seen this book before, I suggest that, that you maybe take a look at it. It has a lot of really great ideas around the, the school as a whole, but I find a lot of them really, really adapt to the library quite well. And this idea of adaptability, flexibility, and variety is one of those ideas that I think works well here. Um, really, adaptability, you can think about as the core st structures within the building. So um, many of you may have seen these, these non-load-bearing interior walls that can be moved as needed. Um, those are things that maybe don't get changed frequently, but it does allow for change over time. Flexibility is something where the building users are allowed to change the space themselves. So movable walls, acoustical partitions, swing walls, we're seeing overhead garage doors that can open spaces up into other spaces, furniture on casters, all of those types of things enable this type of activity. Um, and these things can be changed over the course of days or weeks or, I mean, they can happen quite frequently. And then the other term that we're going to experience here is variety. So this allows users to change the quality of their space by just moving to another area. So in this case, you set up a number of different zones that can be used in different ways throughout a space. And you can use different types of furniture to accomplish this. And then there's you can instantly change. You don't have to move anything to get this to occur, but you can change as you need to do something different within that space. So we're going to just take a little bit closer look at this so you can really get an idea of what these spaces might look like or what I'm talking about here. So this is that adaptability. So in this case, you can see that wall that frames this space. Um, it's something that it's not even a full wall. Um, it's a partial wall. But it creates a, an idea of um, seclusion within this space. It kind of segments this area off. Um, in some cases, these things are completely closed off. If it's something where you need to be concerned about noise. But again, this doesn't create a permanent space within the building. You can move this as you need to. A great one for flexibility, of course, um, and I think a lot of us are probably aware of or have used these types of things, um, are some of these mobile table systems. So the nice thing here is that these table sy systems can be pulled apart and used to accommodate groups of different sizes as needed. Um, and it's very, very simple for the users to change this. There's not a lot of instruction required to, to undertake an activity like this. And then this image really talks a little bit about that whole variety concept. So you can see that there are a number of different spaces set up here that allow the users to go to a different place to do a different activity. And you can see even within these areas, you can still allow for a, a level of flexibility or change. Um, so it doesn't have to be a completely static type of situation. Um, so there's still flexibility to move the shelving around in this space or to change those tables um, to a single or a group use type of thing. So really, what we're looking for is a learning commons that's where the learner, the teacher, and the resources can really interact seamlessly. And designed properly, 
these spaces can really accommodate both the traditional and the 21st century functions simultaneously and provide comfortable zones that really help to support these functions. So it's really important to remember that when you're working within the library environment, the library tends to be or tends to function in an and world as opposed to an or world. So what I mean there is lots of times librarians and libraries need to accommodate some of the old technologies as well as the new way of doing things. So sometimes this becomes a conflict or becomes difficult when you're trying to work through um, the space that you have available um, or, or the needs that you need to support. But if you really think this through and, and do this well, you're able to accommodate both. So now we're going to move into um, David Thornburg's metaphors for primordial learning. And these are really um, kind of a fun, more visual way to think about group dynamics and the needs of the space. So creating variety in the zones of the library is really important to teaching and learning these 21st century skills. Um, David Thornburg's research suggests that spaces consist of four different areas. So first of all, the campfire spaces. And this is somewhere that you learn from the expert. And once we kind of do this overview, I'm going to start getting into some more specifics around how this works for each type of these spaces and give you some nice examples of, of what you can think of um, when you're working on these spaces within your library. So the watering hole would be where you learn from your peers. Cave spaces are spaces to learn from yourself. And life is kind of the idea of how you bring everything together and apply it to the real world. So the things that you learn in all these different spaces help you to be very functional in life in general. So these concepts really translate nicely into space design because they help to set up some of the zones that you can create within your space. So in this particular example, you can see that the shelving really provides a buffer between the different zones. So I don't know if everybody's used to looking at these plans, but you can see here, um, this is shelving, and this is shelving over here and over, over here. And it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of defining these spaces. It's creating a buffer between the different zones. And the collection really helps to frame the teaching areas and create breakout spaces for individual and collaborative work. So you can see the cave space is kind of stuck back here in a quiet corner. Um, the watering hole is up front. This would be your, your entrance to the space. Um, it can be a little bit, bit louder space. Um, and then your campfire space, which is really around your teaching and learning, is, is positioned here. And you can see that really you have, kind of has some screens and things that help to, to section off this space as well. So looking first at the campfire spaces, um, there, there's a need within the school for both formal and informal campfire spaces. And the primary function of these zones is for an expert to impart wisdom, provide instruction, inspire students. Um, so here you're learning from the expert, and these are really your instruction and your lecture spaces. So probably what most of us are most, most familiar with. So, this particular example is a, a formal large lecture style. And these are really indicative of some of the teaching and learning spaces that many of us grew up with and were probably more used to. Um, the formal spaces look more like a traditional lecture style classroom. Um, you can see that the teaching and lecture space is kind of in the front of the room. Oftentimes, there's an interactive whiteboard or a prescription projection screen or flat panel monitors that are visible to the whole area. Um, but even in this particular space, you can see that the furniture is still flexible. It can be reconfigured, and it can meet a number of different needs. Campfire spaces don't always have to look like that. So they don't have to be that standard setup with the, that face where everyone faces the front of the room. Um, lots of times you're seeing in some of these learning spaces that um, now you can add a little bit more flexibility. Um, the furniture can be lightweight, fitted with casters. It can allow for students to easily move the furniture to change from a lecture style to a collaborative group work experience. And these larger tables can accommodate four to six students. Um, th and these are grouped. Um, traditionally, you may have seen a single table. Um, now we have a lot more flexibility when you can go to the smaller tables that can be grouped into smaller groupings. 
not all campfire spaces are large group settings. So sometimes you have a formal small group style setting. Um, in this particular uh, example, these smaller spaces allow for more personalized instruction or tutoring. Um, lots of times with this new emerging concept of the, the classroom, um, there needs to be a space where, where students are able to, to really network with that, that, uh, that instructor. Um, students can learn new content online by watching their video lectures, usually at home, and, and now using the time at school to work on the homework or the assigned problems in class with the teachers offering more of that personalized guidance and interaction with the students instead of lecturing. So whether it's the teacher working with the students or the librarian working with the students, there's just a need for some of these smaller, smaller spaces. We can also be very informal and interactive. So the informal spaces are not purely designed to support that speaker audience situation, but um, easily support whatever function is needed in that particular space. These informal spaces usually incorporate comfortable and easily rearranged um, seating or furniture, like you can see in this particular space. They can be beanbag chairs or cushions, um, or there can be enough floor space that the group can sit in, on the floor in a circle or, or things like that. So they don't have to be real, real formal. Um, You'll also see, in many cases, um, they look somewhat, they can look somewhat like a traditional storytelling space um, that, that's been found in a library. Um, but lots of times now, they can incorporate more interactive technology within the space. So the next space we're going to take a look at are our water and hole spaces. So in these particular spaces, remember we're learning from the peers. So um, group study and collaboration spaces, some of the big, big trends that we're seeing um, in teaching and learning. So you can see in this particular situation, um, this one's using some lounge seating. So these are grouped um, in two settings. They could be pulled together to be one setting. So again, you can change the size of your group. Um, but really, they're designed with a focus on creating comfortable spaces for students to interact with one another. So the primary function collaboration, sharing of ideas, um, an important concept is teamwork and projects become a more important part of the curriculum. Again, the idea is that teaching and learning does not always have to be facilitated by an expert. Really, students are expected to learn from each other. Um, lots of times now, just as much as learning from the experts, and it gives them the opportunity to explore. Um, again, easily reconfigured to support groups of different sizes. So, Collaborative learning is an important qualification for the success in any, any profession these days, and so it's important to, to teach that in school. So um, the schools are incorporating collaborative and group work into their academics beyond the science labs. We used to see this very commonly in science types of setups, but now many of the, the curriculums are including this throughout the school. So offering lightweight furniture on casters, mobile partitions, um, allows for a really easy transition from campfire space to watering hole space. One of the things to think out ahead of time um, as you're thinking about these spaces is different arrangements that might be um, used within this space. So that will help to determine the infrastructure that you need to support the different groupings. So it may be important to provide things like power, um, or you may want to have changes in your flooring. So um, thinking about those things ahead of time and, and playing with different arrangements um, can help to set the stage for that. Water and hole spaces can also incorporate a variety of furniture from different sized tables and lightweight chairs to comfortable mobile lounge chairs with lightweight pull-up tables. Um, so combining variety and flexibility in these areas makes it easy to accommodate groups of different sizes. Sometimes you'll find these spaces are these smaller semi-private types of spaces. Um, the way this space is set up allows for passive supervision of the space, while it still offers some privacy by limiting distractions between the different groups. The other thing to think about is expanding these watering hole spaces outside of the confines of the library. So think about all the available space you have within your school that might be repurposed to expand your opportunities within your school spaces. Um, 
plan for breakout areas outside of this media center. Um, in this particular case, this one's located right outside of the school library. Um, it allows for impromptu study areas. Um, it, it lets uh, those spaces be used maybe when the library is occupied for formal instruction or special programming. It still gives a place for students to congregate and work together. Another thing to keep in mind is in some environments, um, outdoor spaces such as courtyards can sometimes be utilized to expand your space as well. One of the big things to keep in mind here is that there, there is an inherent danger in these spaces being labeled as social spaces. So we're still talking about a learning environment here, and we're wanting to perpetuate that idea that learning can, can occur in spaces other than just the campfire spaces that we were talking about initially. So it doesn't always have to be that expert that's imparting that wisdom. But really, um, embracing the idea of lifelong learning occurring in multiple ways is what, what we're trying to, to facilitate through these different types of learning environments. So finally, we have our cave spaces. So these are where we're learning from ourselves. So there are times when quiet space is important. And you can see in this case, here's our little um, lounge scene set up back in the corner. And you can see in this particular setup, these chairs are kind of, they're, they're facing inward to each other, not exactly working together, um, but they are kind of grouped together. So it doesn't have to be a place where it's completely separated. Um, but students need to be able to have a place where they can assimilate, synthesize, and internalize learning in solitude. So making an effort to create these inviting and comfortable cave spaces where the students can kind of check out of that constant bombardment of information and kind of think and work on their own um, is really a valuable stage of learning that, that is sometimes lost. Um, and if you don't have it, then learning is not always transformed to that knowledge and wisdom stage. So the function of these areas is really to provide space where those students can reflect independently on experiences and quietly prepare for what's next. So offering some variety within the category of cave spaces helps to account for these different types of learning styles. So a cave space doesn't need to completely be enclosed. Um, simple alcoves that leave space for an arrangement of bean bags or individual lounge chairs on casters are a perfect escape for students who aren't easily distracted by the activity that's going on around them. So they can support that individual work um, and kind of give them that separate space. But again, they don't always have to be completely uh, removed. For solitary learners, it's important, though, to block out distractions. So sometimes providing a more cave-like area that's set away from other activity or small study rooms that can offer these students a comfortable zone for quiet reflection or preparation and study is an important thing to think about. So it kind of creates that escape where students can get away. A mobile screen like the Walter product that you see on the right allows for a space to be created wherever it's convenient. So in that case, it's a mobile space that can be moved to wherever it's needed and can be kind of separated from, from the rest of the fray. Sometimes you'll find some of these cave spaces built in as architectural features within, within the space. So these features can be sometimes unexpected and fun, um, and they can add this functional um, and added fun into the space. Oftentimes, supervision is a concern in K-12 environments, um, but really it shouldn't deter you from kind of planning some of these spaces in anyway. Um, two or three solid or semi-solid sides on a space can kind of provide that sense of enclosure without limiting that supervision. Um, so you can still kind of see into that space and you know what's going on, but it makes people feel like they kind of have that place to get away. So creative arrangements of shelving are really a great way to do that. Again, these spaces don't always have to be limited to a single user. So in this particular case, the shelving can create somewhat of a cave space. Um, the one thing that is important, though, is to be able to define that sense of personal space. So in this case, the cushions kind of allow for that personal space to be defined. Um, so, so that's something important to keep in consideration as well. So there's a room within a room that, that can provide a, another space for people to, to get away. Um, comfortable spaces are also important in this. 
So it's not essential for all these spaces, again, to be quiet. So groupings of furniture, um, especially these soft seating types of things, um, can kind of provide that sense of enclosure. There's a lot of variety in how high you can get a back on something these days. And again, you have to do what's right for your environment. Um, but kind of trying to think about how that furniture can be grouped to kind of create those cave spaces for students that aren't easily distracted. Another thing to think about in the top right, um, positioning that furniture with a view to the outside, sometimes just facing people away from the center of the room can help them refocus and think about things differently. And finally, a learning commons is really a technology-rich space as well. So according to School Library Journal's um, 2013 technology survey, 72% of school library librarians say that they're viewed as the tech leader in their school. And I think that this number is probably even growing. So um, historically, oftentimes librarians have embraced technology in their spaces, and they, they have been driving some of that change. So currently, a lot, of, a lot of libraries and a lot of schools are still working around the old desktop computers and the interactive whiteboards. Um, but more and more laptops and tablets are coming into the spaces. Um, the acquisition of tablets or the adoption of a um, bring your own device policy were really a big story in 2014, and they continue to gain popularity as schools institute those programs. The school library is really a place that's expected to understand and support all these different types of technology. Um, so the nice thing about a school library as opposed to the public library is that oftentimes there's a little bit more control over the types of devices that are being introduced into that environment. Um, sometimes the schools are providing those devices, um, so the librarian has the opportunity to become a little bit more familiar with the different types of things that are being used. 43% of K-12 students have their own web-enabled personal device. So students are very, very familiar with this and very comfortable with this, and I would guess that number, too, has grown since the survey was last done. Um, bring your own device programs can oftentimes um, be something that also takes some of the pressure off of school budgets and space allocation. So just depending on, on the philosophy of your school, um, you can sometimes use that to be able to get more, more access to technology for your students. Now, as these personal devices become more acceptable in this setting, um, libraries may not need to dedicate as much space to permanent fixed furniture that supports things like desktop computers. Um, but it is important to continue to think about how you're going to accommodate the charging of the devices, um, you know, so that so that you're able to to make it so that the students can remain um, productive in those spaces. There's a trade-off when you're dealing with the bring your own device versus the, the school supply devices, um, in that the expected staff support and the device maintenance is sometimes a challenge um, in these pure bring your own device environments. But um, it does allow for more flexibility in how a space is designed and furniture, or designed and furnished. The size and scale of the furniture that's needed to support today's computers may be changing. And this is another thing to keep, keep in mind, because computers have been getting much smaller, or you have the laptop units. But it's also important to continue to think about keeping workspaces large enough to accommodate not just the computer, but the other materials that are needed for studying and learning. And again, power access is really a critical element. Sometimes this, um, when there's less pressure on the school budget for the hardware, it opens opportunities for schools to incorporate more specialized technology into their spaces. So a lot of students and teachers are really expecting the library to be a place where they can come and learn about new technologies. And many schools are already incorporating audio and video creation spaces and distance learning tools into their programs. Um, students are developing more and more sophisticated presentations and projects as part of their learning experience. And this, the school library is really an ideal place for some of those activities to occur. Far more hands-on opportunities give students really an edge in their educational career as well as in their future workplace. Maker spaces and library spaces that are allocated for these creative and open-ended activities are becoming more, more and more common. And again, I would guess that these statistics have jumped up quite a bit too. 
23% of schools had them in 2013 when the study was done, and 9% were planning for them. And just what I've seen um, in the popularity of these spaces and, and kind of the attention that they've been gaining, I, I think that we're seeing a lot more of that. Oftentimes, middle schools are the most common place for this. Um, many people think of 3D printers as the defining hardware for the maker space, but the broader sense um, of the term really opens up endless opportunities to provide children with tools to experiment and learn and create and do different things within that space. Some schools are op offering robotics club and Minecraft and computer programming and, and lots of different activities. Steam and STEM are kind of driving this as well. So uh, creating this platform for hands-on learning in the school maker place um, maker space is something that, that really is that can be an important element or something important to think about in drawing students into your space. Um, these spaces are much more interactive and engaging than some of the traditional learning spaces, but lots of people do better when they're, when they're learning by doing or visualizing things. Um, this particular um, graphic came from the Education Closet, which is an online resource, and it illustrates the different skills that kind of utilize, are utilized in this hands-on work. So really being able to get in there and investigate, discover, connect, create, and reflect on what you're learning, and being able to do that together is a great thing as well. So within these maker spaces, you find high-tech and low-tech spaces that are appropriate to all ages. So um, in this particular case, you see high school students working on a Lego robotics project. Um, the top right is a very low-tech um, tinker space, so a lot of hands-on activity there. Um, again, um, these spaces do not have to be elaborate. Um, this was a great example that I found in Stewart Middle Magnet School in Tampa, Florida. Um, they show a before and after their space, the top image looking much more like a traditional library. On the bottom, they just cleared some of those things away and really opened the space up, made it more flexible, um, brought in a number of different activities that students can work on together. And finally, many of you um, reflected that, how do I find the funding to afford these new spaces? Um, I pulled together some resources here, and we can pull together some additional resources um, that you'll have available for you. Um, a lot of grant sources out there, especially around some of these more technology-oriented uh, initiatives. Um, you can go to the Demco Ideas site um, and be able to find um, a lot of these resources along with other things that might help you think about these spaces a little bit um, differently. The biggest advice I can offer around this is just start with a plan. Um, start thinking about what you can do um, within your space. Um, Lots of times your dreams may be bigger than your pocketbook, um, but once you start that plan, you start to develop a platform from which you can engage others to help you with this. Um, I'm finding that many of these projects are often funded outside of the district budget, um, so more and more PTOs or local community organizations, once they can see the plan and understand how it will work and how it will um, encourage students in their learning, they're more than happy to help support those types of things. So once again, it's a really exciting time for school libraries and librarians. Um, they're at the hub of many district technology plans, and librarians are being invited to the table as stakeholders and are considered a critical part of implementing this, these plans. So now is really the time to envision what your library can mean for your school. The future of the school library is a dynamic media literacy learning hub anchoring the entire school around knowledge, expression, collaboration, and creation in both the virtual and visual spaces. So now I've come to the end of my presentation. I think we have a couple minutes left here for questions. Um, again, we'll answer what we can. And for those that we don't get answered, we will get a Q&A um, put together and available to all of you. So Angie, do we have some questions? Uh, yes, we do. Um, one of the questions that came through is uh, from a library that you know, acknowledges this is going to have to be a multi-year phased project. And so the question comes down to is what are the one or two most important things to do first? And I know you just were talking about plans, but if you could elaborate. Sure, sure. Um, so I, I think that, that planning is one of the really key things here. Um, but even before that, really understanding what the priorities are for your students or your community um, within your library space. So 
So um, as you're doing your planning, line those priorities up um, and think about it with a holistic view. So um, even if you can only do one piece at a time, try to start with the holistic plan of how you would envision that space um, and then kind of have some phases that you go through to get to that. Um, lots of times you can enlist the help um, of design professionals to help you plan those phases out as you're going through your library um, and make it really kind of um, a seamless process as you bring in the different parts. And I think what you'll find is as you start into the process, you will get more and more engagement. Um, people will get very excited about what you're doing and it'll help things move forward a little more quickly. Okay, great. Uh, another question that came through was, um, is there inexpensive flexible furniture that can be used to wall off small sections in a large space? I think one of the best things that I've seen there, um, a lot of times people are using mobile whiteboards for a number of different purposes. Um, and there are basically easel size uh, partitions that can be can be put up. And the nice thing about those is that um, you can use a number of those together or you can use them individually um, to provide a lot of flexibility within your space. And then you don't have these large expanses of, of walls that are trying to, to wall things off. But there are a number available at different price points. Um, you can find them you know, in catalogs or um, I guess that probably be one of the places that is most readily available. Um, but a lot of them are much more attractive, too, than they used to be. So you can find things that kind of fit into your space and um, have a little more of a design-driven element to them um, rather than some of the real traditional, um, more functional-looking pieces. So I guess that's one of the things that I've seen used most effectively. Great. Uh, another question came through, um, asked if Demko will do a site visit to give ideas and help provide a project estimate in terms of cost to do a, a library space makeover. Demco does have some of those services through our Demco Interiors group. Um, basically, the way that process would start would be um, kind of an evaluation of, of kind of the size and scope of your project. You don't always need a site visit to get some of that across. Um, we have teams that are very effective at um, kind of walking you through the process and and helping to understand um, what what you should be focusing on, what your needs might be, um, and then if needed, um, certainly a site that can be arranged. Okay. Another question is: Do you suggest surveying the community on what they would like to see the library evolve into? I think one of the key things to think about here is um, what you're defining as community. Um, within the school, um, your community is probably going to be your students, your staff, your administration, the families of your students, um, and sometimes definitely the larger community um, as far as what that space should look like. Um, I think I would start a little bit closer with the people who are using that space on the most regular basis. So um, that would probably be the group within your school. Um, however, if you're trying to get support from your broader community, um, whether it be financial or um, you know what, whatever other type of support the community may be able to provide you, um, then it might be important to pull in some of those outside folks. But I think it's most important to really strive to meet the needs of the majority of people who, who may need services when, within your library. And they may not always be your current users, but the people who you really think should be using your library or could be using your library in a more effective way. Okay, this question kind of uh, just takes that a little bit step further and, and also ties it back to your earlier comments about planning. Uh, but the question came in about which stakeholders do you recommend inviting to the planning process? Um, you know, that's, that's an interesting one because um, part of it may, may revolve around whatever your, your situation is within your particular school or, or library. Um, 
but certainly you're going to need buy-in from your administration, so you're going to want, want them involved. But I think hearing from the students and the staff is, is really important um, because, again, they're the ones who are going to be using the space. Um, the success of your environment is going to be how actively they're using that space. Um, so I think it's extremely important to make sure that they're invited to the table as well. Um, and sometimes we think about these spaces and we think we know what they want, but it's really important to ask them um, and engage them in that process. Um, Again, if it's, a, if it's a larger project where you're going to be using some design professionals, it's great to get that outside perspective. And it's also good to visit other spaces um, when you're kind of going through that whole process. You wouldn't necessarily include them as your stakeholder, but really um, you know, kind of looking at what all is available. So you can even bring some of that, that insight back to those key stakeholders so they can really start to envision what might be possible. Okay, and I think we have time for one last question, and um, this gets a little specific. So uh, somebody asked, what technology do you suggest for grades K through 5? Yeah, I think that's really going to depend on what the technology objectives are for your district. Um, and I'm not sure if you're, if you're looking at um, technology to access resources or some of these things more in the, the maker environment. Um, but I think it's becoming much more common to have um, tablet computers or e-readers or things like that available um, to have students start to explore that way. Obviously, your standard computers um, are something that's still necessary, um, whether they be laptops or desktops or, again, being used to the tablet environment. Um, it's really nice to have some type of an electronic whiteboard or um, an electronic screen that, that can be used within a touch screen type of device um, within that environment. Um, when you're talking about like makerspace types of things, um, oftentimes the Lego robotics types of things are very popular with kids, um, Arduino, um, a lot of the things that you might find through Make Magazine um, can be good resources if you're looking at it from that particular um, aspect. Um, but again, I mean, make sure they're geared towards the appropriate age in the, in the technology and curriculum goals of your particular school. Great. Thank you, Janet. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes, so we're going to wrap things up. But I would like to thank Janet for sharing your insights and ideas around the evolution of the school library. We hope that everyone discovered a few new ideas to try. There was a lot of great uh, examples shown, so thank you very much, and thank you for sharing all of your time with us today. Uh, we do have a brief survey that uh, all attendees will see shortly, and we would like to ask that you take a few moments to fill this out and let us know how we did. We welcome comments and ideas on other topics of interest or speakers that you would like to hear from. Uh, and we do use this feedback and suggestions, and that has helped shape our current program offering. So your feedback is very valuable in making these sessions even better over time. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email with a link to this webcast presentation, so you can view it again and share it with your colleagues. And next week, everyone will also receive a second email with additional resources including the slide presentation and a Q&A log of all the questions we fielded today. So that will be available to you. Again, thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, our next webinar is on March 19th. And that is going to be presented by Susan Gunnawig from Hatch Early Learning. And she will be presenting stemsational learning, what to look for in early childhood programming. And you can also. Uh, Visit DemcoIdeas.com for the upcoming webinar schedule. So again, we're so glad you were able to join us today and hope that you will do so again. Hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.